the human animal isn't doing well in the modern world. We have become domesticated and have lost our wildness. The Human Animal Show explores a return to a state of wild health, our original, authentic human animal. And now your hosts, Frank Forensich and Dr. Rodney King. There we go. Hey, Greg. Hey. How are you doing? I'm hey, good. Hey, welcome. Greg, my, that's Frank. So awesome to be with you, man. I appreciate you taking the time. I'm really excited yeah, to course. talk to you. So the reason I contacted you originally, Greg, is because I watched your YouTube um, video, the TED Talk that you did. And I was just listening to what you said. And I, in my mind, I was like, I need to speak to Greg. I have a few questions. For him. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm here to answer questions. Then. <laughs> yeah, Greg, you know, so I thought, you know, just to, to get started, just as a, a kind of a, kind of edge our way into this, right? Um, my, my first question for you really is this, right? I want to know a little bit about your background, how your indigenous heritage has influenced, you know, influenced your artistic journey because I think that's a, a very important kind of starting point for what we're going to talk about. Sure. Um, well, we'll see. Uh, I was born in Chattanooga, Tennessee. That's where my father grew up. Um, but I was only there for two years. It's in the South, um, which is a odd side of the family. Cause I don't really relate too much to that side um, in the States. It's a whole other thing down in the South. Um, and we moved to Utah when I was two, which is where my mother grew up. Um, I grew up in Park City, Utah, which is a ski resort town on the west side of the Rockies, Rocky Mountains. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that's where I grew up. Is it, It's a ski resort town. There's three ski resorts. Um, there's a, uh, a huge film festival, the Sundance Film Festival. Mm. Um, it's, a, it's a big celebrity point to go because of the amount of uh, ski resorts and lodging and everything. Um, but it was a small town. Uh, my graduating class was 100 kids. And so um, growing up as a brown indigenous kid uh, in the, you know, in high school, it was in the early 90s. Um, in an all white town was an experience to behold. And, and, uh, and yeah, and, and within all of that, there's this interesting sort of journey that I had through really through music, because this is about the same time that I'm seeing hip hop. And, uh, and then I was like super into punk rock. And so all of these things sort of are pushing towards a, um, a kind of, I guess, progressive mindset, but like with hip hop, it was really important because I'm seeing Brown people on television and they're mm. talking about their uh, experiences, which, didn't feel too much different from my experience. My parents, you know, we lived in the ski resort town, which sounds, you know, pretty high uh, on the horse. And um, uh, no, we were broke. Uh, my parents made like just enough money for us to be broke around rich white folks. And so um, that was, that was sort of how I grew up. And so there was, there was a lot of parallels for me and um, growing up in a house where my mother um, who was born on our reservation, which is in Nevada, um, really was struggling with her own sense of pride or identity. She was uh, coming out of an age where you were either really proud of that or really ashamed of it. And mm. she was unfortunately the latter. Um, so I came up kind of wishing uh, to understand more, to know more, um, and ended up being a pretty big catalyst for my family to reconnect appropriately. appropriately. Um but about, I always, you know, and I have, I've had this conversation with my father because my father is white. And um, and he said, you know, you you identify as being native, but you never tell anybody you're white. And I'm like, well, I mean, it doesn't really come up in conversations. So, like, I've always been treated as a native person and um, good, bad, or indifferent. And he was like, well, I think you should tell people, you know, that you're half white. And I was like, well, I mean, I speak English and wear western clothes I, I don't know how more how much more white you want me to be and uh he kind of laughed and said fair enough and and so my identity has really been based on just this process of being treated like a native person coming to terms with being a native person reconnecting as a native person 
um, and and unapologetically allowing that to sort of infiltrate every part of my life ends up, you know, sort of informing the work as well. Mm. So, you know, myself and Frank, we come from the position that we are trying to look at the modern human predicament. Sure. And our perspective is that, you know, things are not going very well. And one of the things that myself and Frank do is we like to look back to the past for the lessons or the teachings that we can now apply today. Because, mm. you know, outside of these divisions that often are made, the reality is that most people have forgotten, regardless of how they identify themselves. If we go, all of us go far back enough into our ancestry, at one point, we were all indigenous. Yeah. And we were all connected to the land. And we were deeply and we deeply embrace the natural world. That has mm -hmm. obviously fallen to the, to the side and to the wayside as modernity has continued to grow as it has with, you know, we can talk about that, but obviously there's been a drive away from, from nature. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm always excited to talk to people as yourself. One, because even if we just look at it from that perspective, Art is an integral part of the human condition. You know, it's something that has been there since the beginning of time. It's always been a very integral part of community, of understanding, of learning. And so I believe that artists have a very integral role to play in our modern society. And, I, and you know, just looking at from where you come from, I think that's really important because, you know, looking at the art that you have done, I mean, many of your artworks address social and political issues uh, faced by indigenous communities. So my question really is, what message or emotions do you hope to convey through your art? And how do you engage viewers in these conversations? You know, I'm going to give you probably a really disappointing answer. Um, <laughs> I, I don't wake up in the morning in, in hopes of changing the world. Um, I accept that if I create something that makes sense and speaks to someone, to an issue, to something, um, and they and they make that part of their identity or part of the vernacular of, of whatever it is they're trying to create, um, I accept that 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 can happen, and and when it when and if it does happen, I accept that that's part of the process. Um, I don't speak in behalf of native people. Um, I speak in behalf of myself and my own, my own perspective and, um, and experiences. Now, of course that speaks to a, uh, shared experience. There is a, a very shared experience. So I am saying things and I am doing things that I recognize that there are hundreds, uh, if not thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people that are having a similar experience, feeling a similar way. Um, there is a responsibility. Um, we believe that uh, um, that artists are essentially medicine people. Um, they actually are people who um, hold a piece of the culture, whether whether that's storytelling or language or visuals. And of course, with technology, that has exponentially expanded into so many different mediums. Um, and I guess, you know, to some degree, I think that that art is sort of my therapy. I mean, it's 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 where I'm going in to find things that I've struggled with in my life and sort of work through it and uh, figure out how does this matter? How does this make sense? Where does it um, go from here? And um, but there's an honesty to it that I have to be comfortable with. You know, I, I can't make something that's contrived and be like, yes, that's what it is because there, there's no integrity in that. Um, so it has to be true no matter what. Um, and not all artists are like this. Um, I just have come to a place where, you know, I've, I've been in activism. I've been in, uh, you know, I've been on, on a national stage um, talking about a number of different issues that affect native people. Um, I'm well versed in history and well versed in um, particular American history, and 
and the social and political pitfalls of that history that has brought us to this point. Um, and so I feel a responsibility to that, but um, I also am cynical. Um, I think, and, 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 and a cynical person is someone who used to be hopeful and now they're cynical. So maybe there's still some hope in there somewhere. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. Um, and in fact, I don't think I've ever heard anybody um, talk about that in the same way that uh, people in Europe and pre people all over the world um, are all indigenous as well and have originated with a relationship with a community and with the earth and with all of the things that are around you. Um, and those things have been ultimately uh, eliminated through monarchy and religion. And, uh, and then of course, by extension, you know, capitalism is probably the, the biggest cause uh, of the elimination of those things. And, and so what that actually ends up creating that I think is just so incredibly important is how many uh, how many generations of division is there from from your origination in uh, in on the earth and that relationship and now and mm -hmm. native people you know good bad or indifferent are fortunate enough to not be very far removed from that and and I think it's why non indigenous people in North America in particular and if not throughout the world are appropriating culture because they recognize that there is something there and they're trying to figure out a way to also connect to it. And they're not going about it in the right way because there's, there's no process to tell you what the right way is. Um, and, and so that creates a really unique set of circumstances that allows us to be connected in a way that nobody else is. I'm literally on the homelands of my forebears that, that is thousands and thousands and thousands of years old. Um, my tribe alone, uh, one scientific thing is, has, uh, has dictated about 15,000 years. Um, and arguably it's longer than that. Mm. So it's kind of an incredible, like this is a really long answer to a very simple question, but <laughs> there's, um, there's just this incredible obligation that I feel while also not feeling that obligation because I'm not audacious enough to think that I speak for an entire group of people, if that makes sense. Did I even answer your question? <laughs> no, you did. And you did it really well. And there were a lot of things popping up in my mind. I was like, oh, I need to ask him this. And that, that's good. And kind of where can we take this? First off, I think one of the things myself and Frank have realized, even if, you know, sometimes it's very hard to come to that realization, that it's not about speaking for an entire nation but it's speaking to our individual truth, which is what you're doing. And by doing that, this is where we open up the opportunity for communication, for dialogue, for learning. Um, I think one of the reasons why people do look to uh, native people is because even if they don't consciously know this, when they hear about what native people's kind of ways of knowing and being are, it speaks to them in a very primal um, state. They recognize it. It's a longing, actually, because when you speak to most people, if, you, if they're really honest, going back to that natural state is appealing. Even if we look at just that, look at what people do when they go on holiday, right? They go out of the city yeah. and they go to the things that would have been the kind of standard norm for our ancestors every single day, except now we've got to pay to go and do it which is kind of a, a weird thing in of itself, right? So I'm not surprised. And I think obviously because of the kind of the, and, and obviously there's been a lot of negative stuff around that. So I don't want to kind of um, not say that, but Hollywood's uh, <laughs> kind of predict, you know, the way Hollywood has kind of put native people out in that part of the world is one of the reasons also why we are drawn to that. But when we start looking at, um, Aboriginals from Australia or the Maori. Um, there are, if you look at it across the board, there is a, there is an indigenous worldview compared to mm -hmm. our dominant worldview, which is what myself and Frank are constantly running up against because it doesn't speak to us. And I think there's going to be a 
turning point. So maybe this will hopefully bring back some of your optimism. I think there's going to be a turning point where people such as yourself and us and other people that we've talked to, people will want to know about that and want, want to learn from us because the more and more as we carry on down this road, we are starting to realize that for all the promises of modernity, none of us are happier for it. Maybe people can pretend as much as they like, but the statistics show that, right? Look at the mental health crisis. Just look at what we've done to the planet. It clearly, we are not in a, the human animal is not in a very good state. And so I think more and more, we're going to want to look for other ways to show up in the world. And one of those will be to look back and to look back to a time when we were in deep connection to nature where we were in reverence to nature, where we understood what the great spirit was about. I mean, even if I look at my ancestry, my ancestry comes from Scotland. And I know it sounds kind of cliche, but the first time, because I, I originally come from South Africa, I was, I was born in South Africa, but if you travel the line backwards, it goes, goes to, to Scotland. And the first time I was in Scotland, it was, the only way I could describe it was like, I really honestly felt like I had come home. It's like my heart opened. It was like I'd always meant to be there. So I can connect with that. I can understand what it is to go back to where you came from because my ancestry for, for, for probably tens of thousands of years lived in communion on that land. And so I get it. So I think, you know, even if you may not necessarily see it that way, you are doing some very important work. Well, I appreciate that. I, I think, um, I think you're right. I, nothing you're saying is wrong. I mean, my experience, you know, growing up in the United States, um, spending time, an enormous amount of time in the Southwest. Um, these are places that I love and places that, you know, this, my family this is what we did for, for family vacation. We went, we went camping. We go spend like two weeks in the desert uh, of Southern Utah or um, sort of East South, Southeastern Nevada. But when, when, I go back to Pyramid Lake, um, which is where our reservation is. And it, it, there's a, a large lake there that used to be part of um, an ancient lake that took almost all of Nevada uh, in what is called the Great Plain or the uh, uh, Great Basin. Um, yeah, it, it's strangely comfortable. It, it's just, it is home and it feels like home. And I think that I do think, you know, without at the risk of sounding cheesy that we are connected to those things um through spirit through uh through genetic memory through you know uh, generational trauma like all of these things come through in that moment and um and the same is true you know because we use drums uh for ceremony and and um and even for celebration and things like that and even just hearing the the beats of those drums is overwhelming and it's such a simple thing, you know, it, it's such a seemingly simple thing. Um, but I have been overwhelmed by those things more than once in my life, because I think that we are inherently connected to the things that, um, that are, that are connected to us. Um, and I think there's power in that. And I think it becomes really easy to forget that here in the United States. One of the things that is, um, <laughs> really strange because it, you know there's national parks um this was done sort of under the flag of benevol benevolence uh to preserve these areas specifically for the purposes of um, generations being able to enjoy them um native people were pushed off of those lands most of those national parks are in places where there was a heavy native presence and uh and those individuals lost the ability to actually connect to those things. Um, but okay, let's say for argument's sake, we are preserving those spaces. Um, when I was a kid in Southern Utah, it was a fairly new thing to go down there and to ride bikes. Um, it, it's, you know, Moab is this little small town, the closest thing that you could get to Arches National Park or to Slick Rock. And this is where you would go and you would ride bikes. And this is late eighties early nineties uh, when mountain biking is really starting to take off. And um, there's a fair amount of people that go down there uh, for that during that time frame. Um, and these are people that want to ride their bikes and they want to connect and they want to be out in nature. They want to see the red rock. They want to 
uh, appreciate the beauty of that space. Um, that space now, 30 years later, is almost completely unrecognizable. So there's still, even in a desire to connect and to appreciate the outdoors and to appreciate something that's beautiful, there is um, still a significant sense of consumption that goes with it, which ultimately affects and can destroy the spaces that we want to uphold. Mm. And I mean, in the same way, just looking at my history and looking back to um, the United Kingdom, you know, prior to the Industrial Revolution, people were in relationship to the land. They would have access to the land. They would be able to go and fish and hunt and all the things that most indigenous peoples of all over the world were able to do. And then the enclosure movement came in where basically the elites closed off all the lands and no longer were people able to actually access those lands, which then put a lot mm. of people in a situation where they had absolutely no choice to move to the cities. So we can argue that there was a ploy for this which then ultimately saw them being integrated into factories and losing that deep connection that they had. And ever since then, you know, we've been on this kind of roller coaster ride of just trying to continuously meet what the expectations are of capitalism and what it says you need to do, the markers you need to meet in order to be successful. But as I keep saying, it is very, very clear to me that it's not working, that we are not happy. And so that, again, speaks to what you just said as well. Is there a tourist board that you could belong to? Because I think you would be a great spokesperson for the UK. <laughs> well, you see, that's the thing, right? Again, not in, to get into that, but I mean, like I said, my family came from Scotland. So we have a, uh, if we talk about England, now we have a real problem with England, right? Because, you know, if we look at my family history as an example, we were forced to take, to abandon our name because, you know, I came from a specific clan and that clan was the, the, the McGregor's and we were forced to basically uh, take our name away because they were trying to break the clans up for many of the similar reasons that we saw happened in the, the United States in the early days. Right. And so mm -hmm. that's the reason why my surname isn't McGregor. It's King, because I, my family were forced to choose a different name. So all of these things have happened to many of us through time and just in different places right and so yeah i mean i think what we really need to do and this is the thing why are we talking to people such as yourself and we you know we recently spoke to um uh, don Foarros jacobs a very well-known um academic and and writes a lot about the indigenous worldview um what we're all trying to do is we're trying to come back to this place where for the longest time, actually things were really good and then things changed. And for some of us, it happened at different times in history, some of us earlier than sure. others. But again, I keep saying this over and over. I'm not surprised that people are looking for these answers and looking for the discussions that we're having because there is this deep-seated need to find that. There's a connection that has been forgotten. And one of the things that you do and the way that I see you present your art is that you are reopening that dialogue you you're reconnecting and i mean you can correct me if i'm wrong i mean definitely one of the things that i i noticed was that you were very fervent about not um putting your art out there as the stereotypical uh native art that many people expect when they go to these fairs and they pick up something that's supposedly you know uh, native you know and uh, mm -hmm. you made that point and so even within doing that you are you are opening a dialogue for a different way to to view things than it typically would be. Yeah, um, I, I think so. I mean, part of it is, you know, being uh, what we call, you know, Generation X and and kind of having that, um, I don't know, punk rock disposition, you know, that's that's what I grew up with. And um, so, so it's funny because, you know, I'll get called a, an activist um, and I sort of reject that because activism has been commodified. It's turned into something else. It's the person trying to turn that into a career and turn it into a book deal, you know, and, and uh, making, making sure that they are not allowing room for anybody else um, in our communities and activists is, or should be somebody that sort of serves the people, uh, not somebody who's looking for gain, not somebody who's trying to monetize their position. Um, and, and, and I, I'm not an activist, um, but, but I would call myself a disruptor because I make a point to go into spaces and to disrupt those spaces. 
disrupt it with my presence, disrupt it with my words, disrupt it with the artwork, disrupt the sort of status quo of understanding um, to disrupt like historical understanding, which is obviously very skewed. Um, you know, the amazing thing about history is the same person wins forever. Uh, how is that even possible? And so going in and, and, uh, and disrupting those spaces as well. Um, and, and I think it's, it's sort of the disposition of my people to do that. Um, but it's also the disposition of sort of what I was drawn to as a kid and, and what I've grown up with. And so um, I'm comfortable in that, that sort of sense of disruption because um, there are multiple ways of looking at things. There are multiple ideas. Um, and, and I think we've been just far enough in this experiment that is the United States of America um, that we can start to really point at things that are not working. Um, and we can also allow ourselves to understand why that's not working, which of course has a historical, it's going to have a significant historical uh, reference as to why those things aren't working. Um, the reason why we don't know a lot about Native people, it's not really taught about in the United States. Um, sometimes you get some regional teachings um, if you have sort of a progressively minded um, city or school board. Um, but like I grew up in Utah and know nothing of the Western Shoshone or the Ghost Shoot, uh, the people who are of those areas. I was never taught anything as a kid. And what few things do exist are made up. They exist within the realm of romanticism to justify the settler colonial action uh, that ended up settling what, what would become the state of Utah. And um, those things also create a lot of, a lot of problems too. And, and so because those things aren't there, it means that the context of understanding native people is rooted in popular media, which mm. is arguably a, uh, and, and I'm not saying this as a conspiracy because I don't think it's a conspiracy, I think it's a it's a concentrated concerted effort to um, to mainstream information in a way that benefits the power structure that is that is the United States, if not Western culture at large. Um, if we omit this information, then we can continue to peddle the idea that America is great, and that America is uh, the land of opportunity. Um, the land of milk and honey, however you want to phrase it, um, there's nothing that undermines that narrative more than the history of this country's engagement with Native people. And 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 if I'm frank, uh, your country is engagement with Native people too. And so the way that colonialism has been set up is this benevolent action to sort of to sort of civilize the world. Um, and that's not what it was. Um, Columbus came here looking for riches. Uh, he came here on accident looking for riches. Mm. Um, he didn't come here out of a benevolent sense of, uh, of ex exploration and understanding and maps or anything else. He came here for one thing and one thing only, gold. And he tortured and murdered and got his men to do horrific things in the name of riches. And, um, and so the idea that he's out discovering the world is this false narrative by his own hand. He kept very specific and very um, detailed journals of what he was doing and why he was doing it and how he was doing it and what he came in contact with and what they did when they came to this side of the world, um, which is uh, now the Dominican Republic and, and Haiti. Um, and, and that is the crux of all of this, this idea that there is something happening that we've been told for generations and generations to the degree that it's been normalized. And we have entire groups of Americans that are incensed that we are talking about Columbus in any other matter than being the person who supposedly discovered America. And people are so bought in because it's so generationally and systemically taught that this is how it was that most of these people don't even know that he never set foot on this continent, that he went to his grave, never knowing that he ended up being in a place other than India, which is where he was shooting for. And so that, those machines, that, those omissions of information of history 
um, are are important because if we start talking about what really happened, it will start to unravel the uh, romantic idealism that is uh, rooted in telling Americans, if not the rest of the world, that America is great. Uh, America is not great. America has problems. <laughs> yeah, and that's that was very well said. I'm going to give Frank a second you know, to jump in, but I just wanted to mention this for anybody that was listening to you talk. One of the things that I think would be incredibly important if they're interested in this is to go read a book. Um, it's called The Dawn of Everything. And the reason why I think that's very important is because the authors make the position and, it, and they it's credible and they back it up with research saying that actually, if you look at it, the enlightenment that happened in Europe was likely um, motivated, not necessarily motivated completely, but informed by indigenous worldviews. So the time that was spent in America at that time and what was coming out of it and the discussions gravitated over to Europe, which ultimately then when the enlightenment came about, many of those ideas are found in indigenous worldviews. And so for those people that are interested, the, the dawn of everything is definitely a book to look into. I would even add one quick thing, just a, sure. an excellent yeah. example of that. Um, so our country and, and, and for um, anybody that kind of pays attention to the United States, the constitution is talked about all the time, the constitution of America. It's this, this document that sets everything apart. That document was wholeheartedly inspired by the constitution of the six civilized nations of the Northeast of the United States. The original groups of people that were um, in touch with the pilgrims and the Puritans that were coming over to the United States and realized that there was this um, group of people that had come to an agreement and had created a constitution. Our constitution is based on that. And you have to actually look to find evidence of that. But it is wholeheartedly because all of the so-called forefathers of the United States were talking to these people. They were engaged in these people. They were living amidst these people. They were learning from these people where to go, the best trees to work, the best animals to kill, like all the things that were happening were informed by native people. Even this document that is held up as the uh, really the sort of pinnacle of uh, America's greatness as a founding document for the United States of America. Um, but you don't learn about that. It's not readily available because it undermines the um, the stories that are there. Mm -hmm. It's true. Frank? Yes. Well, I have a question. Do you think it's fair to say that Native voices and Native cultures are starting to get some traction in, in the larger arena. And it, my example here is that we're starting to hear these land acknowledgements prior to people giving presentations. And you don't have to go back very far. We, we never heard that before. And now it's commonplace yeah. in the Pacific Northwest and a lot of the, the webinars and, and such that I participate in, it's common now to hear land yeah. acknowledgements. And it, so it seems like there is a sea change underway and white people are starting to realize how um, how confused they are about their own culture and they're looking yeah. for guidance. And that must make you feel kind of strange, right? Having white people <laughs> come to you for guidance. It's kind of rich. Yeah, I... Uh, I would agree with you. I think that there is um, in the United States. I mean, I can't speak for the rest of the world, um, but the, in the United States, um, native voices are being given quarter where they never have before. Um, and, and there's a lot of pitfalls and blind spots, of course. Um, but uh, I speak and have uh, often been a lecturer in academia in the United States uh, about everything from race and diversity and art and activism to um, really just uh, even basic concepts around um, indigenous knowledge and history. And um, the land acknowledgements started, I started seeing them probably 2016, maybe 2015. Um, so it hasn't even been, you know, 10 years. Um, and it's pretty prominent and pretty prevalent. Natives have mixed feelings about those things because uh, most of it is lip service. Most of it is just saying words, which makes everybody feel good. 
Um, I am a, a huge fan of, you know, we live in a capitalist society that you should put your money where your mouth is. Um, and so anytime I've participated in something that is asking me, should we do a land acknowledgement? I usually will be like, only if you donate to these organizations that are doing the good work. Um, and, and, you know, you could, you could donate five bucks, but you know, if there's 200 people in that room, it starts to add up. And, uh, and so that is ultimately a big part of it. We we're in this interesting place because, you know, black lives matter became a huge thing, um, in, uh, probably, I think it was like 2016, 2015, 2016. Um, and then they had sort of a second round in, uh, 2020 where it just exponentially grew, and and blew up and we started actually seeing a lot of change happening in the united states the washington football team changed their name from a racial slur uh to something else which was not a move made um out of a sense of duty and obligation um it was done because nike threatened to pull <laughs> all of their sponsorship and uh fedex field which is um the field they play in is fedex field fedex was threatening to pull um, their name sponsorship as well. So that's why they ended up doing those things. Um, but you know what, you know, movement is movement. So things start changing in that way because there are people behind it that are being like, okay, I know how to get to you. We can pull this stuff. We can make those decisions. And so there's all these moves that happen. Um, I'm actually work in, um, I don't work in, I, I, I am connected with the cycling industry here. There's a huge, a uh, burst of energy in, in gravel riding. And I'm kind of in the hotbed of that area. Um, and so I have connections with uh, Cannondale and with SRAM and with all these companies that are doing that, the um, different uh, bike products. And it's interesting watching the the bike community and especially because I, I pay attention to European racing as well, um, how overwhelmingly white that industry is. And so the United States is trying to diversify that because of 2020 um and they're starting to get into these places where they're where they are trying to make the best move and put their good foot forward but they miss the point because here in the u.s if you're going to invite a marginalized group of people to participate in a space that's not inherently for them either economically or culturally or socially um you have to expect them to also bring their uh, marginalized group problems with them. I mean, statistically speaking, if you invite 10 black people to the table, some might not have a lot of money. And so they're going to bring those things with them and not have access to the things that you want them to have access to in order to participate. And so those things are starting to change. But like I said, a lot of pitfalls and things attached to them. Um, I think the biggest cultural currency that is available to everybody in the U.S., um, and and I think the rest of the world sees this as well, um, is is popular media, films, television, um, and and in sort of to a lesser degree, social media. Um, these things have the sort of social currency attached to them that really puts things onto a world stage. Representation of Native people within popular media has exponentially changed over the years. Um, they had, I mean, it didn't do very well, but there was a film that came out called The New Mutants, which is based on a comic book. Um, and the lead person for that is Native. And, uh, and nobody really like paid attention to it, which is, which is good and bad. Um, it, it's bad because like there needs to be recognition of that representation, but it's also good because this is a human being. Mm -hmm. This is a person who's participating on an equal plane as everybody else. And that's incredible. So my kids see that and they're just like, that's really cool because they recognize that. Um, in the United States here, there's a series called Reservation Dogs. I don't know if that's getting uh, off our continent or not. Um, and it is a representation of Native kids on a reservation in uh, Oklahoma. And it's not about spiritualism and Indianism and all of the wonderful uh, romantic crap that is often associated with Natives. Um, it is modern. It is contemporary. It is mental health. It is economic struggle. It is hilarious. People don't realize that like native people of North America are freaking hilarious. And it's, uh, I think a, a, a really good, um, I think it's a, um, 
it's a tactic for survival. <laughs> and so it's like a, uh, something that's important. But if you're around us enough, like we're going to give you a hard time and it's going to be hilarious. But we're seeing these things on a national stage and it's slowly but surely changing uh, for sure. I can see some changes. I'm, I'm just wondering if you've tracked this writer, Sherman Alexi. Does that ring a bell? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know. I, I, know. I haven't heard from him recently, but there's a great story about him. He, he was uh, in a bookstore presenting one of his books, talking to a white audience, and they were talking about the environmental crisis and so on. And he quipped at the end, he said, uh, and he was talking about his people and talking to white people. And he said, you're going to need us. And I'll never forget that. It was like, you you white people don't understand your relationship to the planet. You don't understand your relationship really to much of anything. You're going to need our indigenous worldview. And I think he was right. Yeah. I think also like- No, just, I, just, I think yeah, he is right. Yeah, Greg, just before you mention that, just on that point, what I think is also important to, to point out here, because- I get it that, you know, it's oftentimes, especially like in the, in the, in the United States, we talk about, you know, white people, but for me, it's like, it's just, there are a bunch of people on this planet, regardless of their color that have completely bought hook, line and sinker into the modern kind of narrative and a capitalistic narrative where it's about consumption. It's about, you know, all about me. It's about competition. And really at the end of the day, regardless of where you find yourself in the world, if that's your driving force, then the problems that we see happening are going to happen regardless of where I am on the planet. And again, that's mm. the that whole point of saying, well, there is a dominant worldview. That's the way I like to look at it rather than you know putting colors up. I like to think there's a dominant worldview. Anybody can become a victim of that, to be honest, because it's so insidious. Or there mm. is an indigenous worldview. And they don't, they're not the same. One is regenerative and the other one isn't. The other one has a finite kind of trajectory, you know, right? eventually it's going to run its course and it's going to blow itself out. And I guess we need to decide which side of the worldview do we want to be on? Because one side's going to lead to the annihilation of all of us, including the planet. And the other side is going to ensure that, that it doesn't. And Obviously, for somebody like myself that has children and hopefully one day have grandchildren, right? I want to see them being in a world, in a worldview that is going to kind of promote all the positive things we've been talking about and not all of this continuous mm -hmm. ideas of consumption at any cost, materialism at, you know, at any, at any cost. Or if you get these things, then you are successful, right? This whole kind of hyper competitive model that we found ourselves in. So, yeah, that's my perspective. Um, all right. There's a lot to unpack. Uh, <laughs> there's, um, well, first, first, I have to mention, you haven't heard from Sherman Alexi because uh, he got caught up in the Me Too movement. Um, this is really interesting because I think it really shows how uh, this consumer culture, even, even those that sort of present themselves as the most... Uh, benevolent sort of in that space, providing wisdom um, can be infected by this consumer culture. The belief that I can raise myself above you. I can treat you a certain way because I have this much clout or these pieces of paper that said I have this education or whatever. Um, and I think Sherman Alexi got caught up in that. Um, but at, at the same time that that happened, it turned out um, he was also a significant gatekeeper within the writing community, trying to present himself as the only Native person who's writing anything worthwhile. Um, I love his books. I think he's a great writer. Um, but he was doing some pretty predatory stuff as a writer and gatekeeping young writers from being able to sort of have their comeuppance uh, within within the uh, world of literature. And as a result of him doing all that, he ended up having to step back. And it has opened the floodgates of native writers. There are so many native writers doing incredible work right now as a result of that. And so even native people are not, and, and myself included, are not, um, they are are not unable to be affected by these things as well. They are significantly strong. They are significantly ready to pounce on you and to get you to buy in to this, this idea of consumer culture. In the United States, the discussion of race is a really, really, really important discussion. And it's a, it's a one that is 
um, filled with vitriol. It's one that is filled with um, a lot of upset, um, all of which I would say on some one level or another is legitimate. Um, I agree. I think that we're all human beings and that we're all trying to live our lives and do the best we can. Um, if you are trying to take this indigenous worldview and trying to apply that to your life to be a good uh, citizen of the world or however, however you would want to phrase that, um, I think that that's important. But I also think that we have to be careful because if we say that, it can sometimes take away from the inequity that exists among these different folks that are from race classes and um, economic classes and social classes, um, which is very stark here in the United States. And so I've heard people say like, well, we're all human beings and, um, and, and we should not focus on the negative. We should focus on the positive. And I agree until a police officer pulls me over and has his gun drawn because I have expired tags on my car and I'm not a threat to him, but because of, because of my appearance feels that I'm a threat and that the, the possibility of being gunned down by this police officer goes exponentially higher because of all of the things that he perceives, which has to do with race and class and social standing. All of those things are in play. And so in order for us to all be human beings, we all have to be treated like human beings. Um, I have a, a keynote coming up uh, this weekend with the American Association of Museums talking it's the largest museum conference uh in in the country and talking about these things these issues and you cannot possibly invite people to participate in something under the flag of equality without making sure that they are on equal footing that you are on and it doesn't work otherwise you like you can't bring native people to the table to inform indigeneity in these spaces, they need to be paid. They need to be compensated. They need to feel comfortable and as confident in that space as you do and making sure that that is the level of equality that we're looking at. So on a grander scale, it's difficult to have that conversation because I think idealistically, we want to believe that we're all human beings and that we all like are on some level having a human experience together. Um, but on a micro level, I'm having a hard time paying my rent. And so, you know, like the, the person who's not having a hard time paying their rent, like we're having two completely different conversations. And how incredible is it that we're all speaking English in this country and in your country, um, and we're all saying the same words and how quickly those same words can mean something completely different from each other. When it ultimately means we're having a conversation, but we're not saying the same things. We're finding that in this country as well which is creating further division because of the misunderstanding that exists with that. Mm, yeah, no, totally agree. I mean, not to that, not to that level. And I would never put myself there, but you know, I grew up in South Africa. I grew up on the South side of Johannesburg, which is when I was growing up and still is to, to this day is a very impoverished neighborhood. There was a stigma. If you said you came from that area, right? Especially as you left that area and you went into what was called the Northern suburbs and the Northern suburbs would be the place where, the rich people lived, right? And so mm -hmm. I can get that. I understand part of that. And, and that was my childhood. And I, I fought against it my, my entire life. I mean, I was kicked out of the house when I was 17. My mother was a raging alcoholic. Pretty much everybody in my neighborhood had dysfunctional families. They were either drug addicts or alcoholics and, and stuff like that. I, I ended up sleeping on the inner city streets of Johannesburg. I had nowhere to go. I enrolled into the military early because that got me off the streets. I only educated myself later on in life, once I'd been able to, quote unquote, get the magic markers of success, which in other words is make some money, right? So I, I totally get that. I guess the thing for me always is this, is that if, if we had started with a different point of view, a different worldview from the beginning, not the, the kind of dominant one we're talking about right now, which is capitalism mm -hmm. and, and all those things, we would be in a very different place, I think. And that's unfortunate. And I guess I hope so. Yeah. The question really is, is that, you know, are we ever going to be able to turn things around? Are we ever going to be able to get back to that? Because 
regardless of which indigenous community you look at, and I don't want to over romanticize it, but of course, that is not the case. Um, but if you look across the board, like I keep saying, there are very similar beliefs. There are very similar ways of showing up in the world. And that seems to me to me to be the most um, integrative of all the possible positions that we could take. And I guess, again, coming back to what I've been saying throughout our interview is that this is one of the reasons why I think there's this kind of rejuvenation, this re you know, re the new energy of wanting to find these these things out. But not to keep you any longer, Greg, because, you know, I get it, you know, we're all busy. Um, based on everything we said, right, let's try and maybe hopefully finish off with a positive. What would you want to leave us with? As an artist, as a disruptor, <laughs> give us your best punch. Gosh, man. I, uh, I don't know. Um, I think, um, I know for me, you know, I actually live in an area that is, um, that is arguably too conservative to function. Um, there's a lot of far right folks around here. There's a lot of conspiracy theories. Um, a lot of in the United States, a lot of people open carry their guns, mm -hmm. um, and conceal carry their guns. Um, and so my disruption of, uh, those spaces, I have to be careful here. Um, I can be less careful in other places. Like, uh, when I'm in Denver, Denver's a lot different of a place to go to. Um, but I think wherever I go, I always find people that, I always find people that, that on some level are, are either completely like-minded or close enough to be like-minded that we just start nudging them towards a place that's, that's, that's better. Um, I can't control everything, uh, but I can certainly be kind to people and I can certainly treat people with respect. Um, I can do my best to, to serve others, uh, in, in the best way I can. And, and for me, this is a challenge. Um, I'm, I'm genuinely a grumpy human being. And, uh, and so I, I want to try to put my best foot forward. Um, but I am surprised by people. Sometimes there are people out there that uh, might not look like they would be the person that you might befriend, um, but they can actually become that. And, and so I think on an individual level, I think we just need to be kind to one another. Um, educate yourself. Uh, apply those knowledges, those understandings to your life, to your daily uh, place, to your family, to your workplace, uh, to your church, to your community. Um, it's actually pretty easy to normalize goodness in your communities and um, and really just only needs a couple of people to kind of start gently pushing those things and pushing it not in a way that is contentious, but to push it in a way um, that is kind and uh, and that is understanding, um, you know, there, there's a there's a movement happening in the United States right now called Land Back. Um, where natives are literally trying to obtain land back um, and they'll talk about it. And it's not just about land. It's also about knowledge. It's also about authority in places where we should have authority. We want to have that authority back. We need to be able to inform what's happening. And I think that I know a lot of native people that want to burn it down and, and I completely understand why that is. Um, and, and, uh, and to a certain degree, even struggle to not feel exactly the same way. Um, but I don't think it takes much for me to say to somebody, I understand why that, that term, that concept, that land back is a lot to deal with a lot to take in, maybe even intimidating. We can help people understand through kindness and through patience. Um, and I think that we can change the spaces that we're in one person at a time. And I think that that's okay. And, um, and I do my best to do that when I'm not hiding out in my studio and not dealing with people. Um, and not, I talk a lot of, I talk a lot of crap to the open carriers. Uh, when I see them, I always ask them if they're cops and they say no. And I, I say, Oh, so you're a cosplayer. Um, so, you know, those things are, are never, nobody takes that well, but <laughs> these are, these things are funny to me. And I can share that. And that's funny to everybody else. Maybe it makes it a little less scary. Um, but I do think that kindness is uh, is probably where it's at on, on some level. That That's our humanity. Our humanity is in that. <laughs>
that mm. space of kindness. Yeah, totally agree. And fantastic. And we come full circle, which is what I started off by saying, right? Each one of us individually can make a difference. And that's really what you've spoken to. Anyway, Greg, fantastic chatting to you, man. Um, let's keep in contact. That was amazing. Yeah. And, and we'll let you go. And I'll let you know when it's out. I appreciate it. I, I appreciate the time and the invite. And yeah, if you guys need anything, let me know. I'm around. Absolutely. Awesome. Great. Have a great day. Great to meet you. You too. Man. That was great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so thoughts thoughts on that, Frank? I mean, I know I did most of the talking on that one because I knew about him and his work. And so obviously I kind of had my my questions lined up in yeah, my Yeah, yeah. No, mind. that that was that was great. I mean, he he talks in big chunks. And that's just his style, you know, and I think I get a little impatient sometimes when I, I like uh, to have shorter segments that we could respond to. But, you know, it, it's everybody's different. So. Yeah, I, I mean, I can. Yeah. So that's where that's why it's good that we do this together, because I actually like the big chunks, to be honest, because yeah. okay. then that that makes it easier to ask the next question. Cause sometimes when, when we just got these smaller kind of responses, it's sometimes very hard to keep the conversation going or to right. find the next appropriate thing to say. So actually it's really great. And yeah, I think he, he had some great things to say and it was, it was totally, it was totally fascinating. And uh, yeah, we, 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 we were talking to some really cool people at the moment, which is, which is exciting. Hi, Dr. King here, and thank you for taking the time out of your busy life to listen to myself and Frank as we explore with our guests ways to return the human animal to wild health. For more information on Frank, you can go to his website at exuberantanimal.com or visit humananimal.info to find out more about my coaching programs, read the blog, get your hands on some human animal gear, or explore our upcoming events. Until the next time, stay wild and free.